here as a business traveler. To be honest, I really don't want to be here at all. So why am I, Keith Jones, waiting at Bangkok Station for an overnight train to Chiang Mai? Well, this story is one of deceit. Theft, police incompetence, international loopholes, and the apathy of a major corporate bank. It is also my story of how almost entirely on my own, I tracked down a sophisticated gang of fraudsters. This is my second time in Bangkok in two years, and exactly as before, I'd rather not be here. But unfortunately, sometimes there are things that you just have to do, whether you like it or not. I'm about to board an overnight train to Chiang Mai, a 14-hour journey to the north of Thailand. That is if I can get into my compartment. I'm making this film as a record of the atrocious and ridiculous events that have led me to this point. I guess that I'm also making it as some sort of catharsis. And finally, I'm making it as a stark warning to others. Life can be strange sometimes. One minute you can be travelling along thinking that everything is OK, and then almost out of nowhere, the malicious actions of another person can affect your life forever. This is the voice of one such person. We're doing something in collaboration with them. It's an excellent project, Keith. I can't say that enough. If, if you like this one, you're definitely going to love the one that's coming. He was known and, to me uh, as Edward Martin, but that certainly was not his real name. For almost 18 months, he pretended to be something that he was not. And to my misfortune, I lost a tremendous amount of money. My story begins back here in Australia. I was working from my office one day when the phone rang. It was a company calling themselves Humphrey Capital Investments, a global financial services group with offices in California and Singapore. Over the coming weeks, I had several informal conversations with their senior portfolio manager, John Thompson. One of his recommendations was to invest in Nokia shares. Down from a high of $28, and with a forthcoming launch of a new range of phones, this seemed to present a good buying opportunity. Humphrey Capital Group sent me client forms, and after processing my application, they bought Nokia shares on my behalf. I subsequently paid the invoice by bank transfer to their company account at a HSBC branch in Hong Kong. Over the coming weeks, John Thompson rang me several times to discuss my portfolio. But at the end of the month, he rang to tell me that his company had been bought out by a group called Wellnick Investments. My new advisor would be Edward Martin, the vice chairman of Wellnick Investments. Wellnick's credentials looked similarly impressive, and their website showed detailed information on the company. A few days later, I had a call from Edward Martin, and like his predecessor, he had an American accent and came over as professional and friendly. He explained that he'd be my new advisor, and he looked forward to a long and profitable relationship. And to be honest, that's exactly how it turned out to be. It was a long relationship, and for him, it turned out to be very profitable. Over a very long period, he built a strong and trusting business relationship. And as he did so, I purchased a variety of low-risk US stocks, trusts, and deposits. All trades were paid for through their account at a HSBC bank in Hong Kong. Subsequently, like the proverbial lamb to the slaughter, I continued to make investments through the Wellnick Group, and within 12 months, I'd invested over 110,000 US dollars. To be honest, even saying it now makes me feel quite sick. You often hear that people are scammed through greed, and where unrealistic returns are involved. But most of my investments with Wellnick were supposed to pay around 10 to 12 percent per annum. Good but at the time, not unrealistic. In fact, it was only when things started to sound too good to be true that I became suspicious. One day, Edward Martin called to tell me that he had some very exciting news. He explained that our investment in the development company Hilton Asia Pacific was about to make us a great deal of money. Apparently, this was now a very hot stock, and institutional investors were now willing to purchase my $4 stock for $18. 
Not only that, as we had options, we could buy more shares at the original price which meant that with just the $75,000 investment, we would be able to achieve a return of almost $700,000 in just a couple of weeks. Not bad, eh? But of course, Hilton Asia Pacific turned out to be a fictitious company. But here's the bit that still gets me. He encouraged me to do anything I could to find the extra money, even if I had to borrow it from friends, remortgage the house, in fact, anything, as this really was a chance of a lifetime. I was becoming more and more convinced that I'd been a victim of an elaborate scam. I received an invoice from Wellnick Investments for $75,000. In the meantime, I started a few investigations of my own. I contacted Nicholas Design to see if they really were involved in designing golf courses for Hilton Asia Pacific. And my worst suspicions were confirmed when they told me that they had never heard of Wellnick or the project. Similarly, I contacted the World Wildlife Fund, and again, they had never heard of Wellnick Investments. I tried to call Wellnick in both the US and Singapore, but strangely, all their lines had gone dead. It's very difficult to put into words what I felt at this time. Shock, anger, frustration. Anger particularly. Anger at not only the thieves, but anger at myself for becoming a victim. Then there was the relationship with my family. I honestly felt that I'd let them down. And of course, there was the loss of a considerable amount of money. How did I feel when I found out we'd lost all that money? Well, I really, really just couldn't believe that it could happen to us. And I felt so sorry for Keith because I just knew how he would be feeling with something like that happening to him. So someone in this situation will be hit with immense trauma, grief, loss, shame, embarrassment, lack of self-esteem, lack of self-worth, feeling a failure. They need to know that that's a very typical response. That's something that we would expect. Then we have severe depression, possibly suicide, and then it's possible that we may, may even um, take on homicides as a revenge. So it really can escalate into something very big. Post-traumatic stress disorder is later on, a few weeks down the track, where we may have nightmares, we become isolated, we withdraw, um, we become super sensitive and startle at the slightest response. We're very sensitive to triggers. That's post-traumatic stress. I was lucky. With the help of friends and family, I came through the worst of it. The way we got through it, well, it was tough, but we spent a lot of time talking to each other about it, going through the different scenarios, reliving and replaying what had happened during those months. But at the end of the day, we decided it just wasn't going to beat us. In order to keep the trail alive, I emailed Wellnick and explained that I was having trouble trying to raise the $75,000. As if by magic, they came back online with a new phone number and a cock and bull story explaining that their telephone system had been hit by a virus. And Mr. Martin would call me that very day. And of course he did. But from that point on, I started recording all our telephone conversations. Over the next couple of weeks, Edward Martin rang me a few more times. He encouraged me in a variety of ways to invest, and I kept making excuses and telling him that the money was coming. But in the end, I believed that he decided that nothing was going to happen. And very soon, all contact was lost again. Oh, apart from the fact that Wellnick Investments sent me an overdue account statement. As professional as ever. But if you think that's the end of the story, well, you'd be wrong. In fact, it's only just the beginning. During those few weeks while I was still in contact with the fraudsters, I tried to involve the authorities. But quite frankly, they weren't interested. The loss of the equivalent of 110,000 US dollars was, and still is, a lot of money to me. But in the grand scheme of things, small fry to the police. Coupled to this, as the crime was not committed on Australian soil, no one was really that interested. For example, when I informed the Australian Federal Police, their advice was that I should ask the criminals for my money back. An interesting tactic. This was a very frustrating time, as I felt that while I was still in contact with the criminals, there was a good chance that we could track them down. I contacted the HSBC Bank in Hong Kong 
and tried to explain that criminals were using their bank for money laundering and that others like me could well be being defrauded. But their email made it clear that they did not want to become involved. Excellent. So criminals can hide behind the Privacy Act. But it does make you wonder how a bunch of criminals can open a bank account with a reputable international bank. There's more of my run-ins with the HSBC later in the programme. It was about this time that I eventually got some help from the local police. And in particular, this man. I became involved in this matter when uh, I was appraised of a gentleman by the name of Keith Jones who had lost a considerable amount of money through what appeared to be fraudulent uh, activities uh, by a group that were based overseas. Well, at first on visiting Mr Jones and uh, obtaining the uh, content of the complaint, uh, I uh, conducted some initial investigations. Those inquiries that I had conducted uh, negated that consideration. Uh, and I then further contacted the fraud squad. And indeed, the fraud squad did visit me and examine the evidence. But that's about all they did. And the reason for that? The fraud squad usually handle matters of considerable value, way above the amount of money that was involved in this uh, instance. Uh, and uh, when it was established that probability it was overseas, it's a matter of reporting and uh, seeking assistance from Interpol and the country concerned, but at that stage the country concerned wasn't identified. So there you are. You can imagine how frustrated and helpless I felt. No one seemed to be able to help, and even if they could, it was all just too hard. Uh, early inquiries in respect to this matter were not progressing at all, and uh, as the communication uh, ceased uh, from the uh, suspected persons, uh, I believe that there was little further could be done when we had no country of origin of the uh, perpetrators. So there I was, with what seemed to be a helpless situation. Unless I could at least find out what country the scammers had operated from, there was nothing I could do. Over the coming months, I became consumed with finding them. Every spare moment I had, I spent on the computer, learning how emails worked and using specialised software to see if I could find out where these criminals were based. The fraudsters had told me that they were in Singapore, and at first everything pointed to that. I contacted the Singapore police, but matters were drawn to a close when I received an email telling me that as the offence was committed outside the Singapore jurisdiction, that they would be taking no further action. This not-in-my-backyard attitude seems to be the perfect loophole for this type of criminal. A business commitment took me to Hong Kong. I decided it was my opportunity to visit the HSPC. I felt that at the very least that they had a moral obligation to help, as in my opinion they were more or less complicit in their actions. I wanted to know how a fraudulent company could open several accounts with a supposedly reputable international bank. Before my trip I had emailed, faxed and written to the HSBC explaining the situation and asking for a meeting, but unfortunately they did not acknowledge or reply to any of my correspondence. Everywhere I look, I'm surrounded by HSBC. Well, here I am outside the HSBC centre. So far I've written to them, I've faxed them, and every time they've just ignored me. So let's go inside and find out exactly what they have to say for themselves, shall we? Is it possible to speak to somebody concerning fraud at all? What? Fraud? Is it possible to speak to somebody about fraud? Sorry, I don't know. You don't understand? Okay. Right. Who can I talk to? I need to talk to somebody to speak English? Hello there. Hi, is it possible to talk to somebody about fraud, please? Yeah, is it, is it possible to speak to somebody about... No, I want to talk to somebody about... Um, Sounding like a typical so tourist abroad, I try to explain my plight, and eventually I'm directed to another office. Hi, I'm not sure. I've just set, was sent here from... Do you speak English? Yeah, I was just sent here from the front desk. I'm trying to talk to somebody about fraud, about some money that was stolen from me. And they've just sent me in here and said that you might be able to help. 
So do you have the you call the money? No, it's a long, long story. I have written to HSBC several times, uh, but nobody's ever written back to me. And I'm in, in Hong Kong at the moment, so I'm taking this opportunity to, to drop by on you guys. But do you have the account is already maintained or...? It's somebody else's account that I transferred money to. The accounts in Hong Kong? Or? Yes, they were, yeah. The yeah. account in Hong Kong? Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a, a fraudulent company that don't exist anymore, and they stole some money, so I'm now making a TV documentary about it. Mm. Can you talk to me, or is there somebody else to talk to? But actually, because this is standard, if you want to know about the, uh, the, the accounts, I think that you're better to go to the branch to make the uh, inquiry. Well, I need to speak to somebody high up. You must have people in HSBC that deal with fraud. Do you understand what the word fraud means? At this building, there are no, no branch managers here. No, I don't want to talk to a branch manager. I, uh, you must have somebody like security people who deal with fraud. No. I'm talking 150,000 Australian dollars, nearly a million dollars Hong but Kong. But you have transferred it from your country to Hong Kong. Correct. But they, have they received it? They've received it, but they've stolen it. It was a, it was a. But we can't. No, I, no I'm not asking for the money back. I, don't, yes. I just want to talk to somebody about it, in terms of you know how these things happen. Uh, for the privacy of personal, we can't expose any uh, information. information to you mm. for the other party. Okay. Mm. So, um, I think you go to branch or to talk to someone is um, no use for you. Need a better. Mm -hmm. Um, or you can go to the branch to report it first, mm. see whether they can do it with you by the procedure. Okay, all right. Okay. All right, thank you then. You're welcome. Bye. <coughs> well, I'm sure you got the gist of that. Um, they're saying to go back to the original branch to uh, make the complaint, and uh, they'd only get involved if the police were involved anyway, which um, I knew that months ago. Uh, it's just like chasing your tail, isn't it? Next step, the HSBC Corporate Centre. Most definitely situated on the better side of town. Look at that, two great big lions to protect somebody's money. I'm not sure if you can help me, but is it possible to speak to somebody about fraud? I spend the next several minutes trying to explain the situation, but I don't really think that she has a clue what I'm trying to say. But eventually, I moved on. No, I'm sure I'm not in the right place here. <laughs> I don't even think I should be filming it here. Might end up in a Hong Kong jail myself. After another long, painstaking wait, I'm eventually directed to meet a bank representative. You mean you have from the Australia? Yeah. And then? Yeah, I'm... I am... Um, sorry. I am um, from Australia, okay, and... I try to explain the situation so far. Ago, I, got involved I pass him a copy of the facts I'd sent to the bank. The HSBC and then times, the confusion the really begins. But this two accounts your company account? No, they're, they're, they're somebody else's accounts. These are the people that have stolen my money. They don't exist. These companies are fraudulent companies. But you... For the next 20 minutes, all we do is go round in circles. No, 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 no. These two companies have stolen my money. In Hong Kong? In Hong Kong, into, that, into those accounts. In Hong Kong, you have an account in Hong Kong? No, I don't have a HSBC account. You have HSBC accounts. There they are, those two there. I've transferred money to these to accounts, the account. to these two accounts, and they have taken my money. They've mm. stolen it. Oh, you've stolen your account. They have stolen my money. I think you need to contact the police station because uh, this company has stolen your, your account. Mm. You need to report to the police station. The file is a what kind of problem mm. the police. All right. Yeah. It won't work because it doesn't work that way because you, you cannot report a crime unless it was committed in that country. You need to fool the police. Mm. It doesn't work like that. This is why 
people like this get away with it and banks like you can't help people like me, I've lost a million Hong Kong dollars. I understand. You and you can't help me. It doesn't work like that, I'm afraid. It doesn't work like that. Thank you. Over the coming months, my investigations took me down frustrating roads and up blind alleys as I tried to contact organizations around the world whose services had been employed by the scammers, all in the hope that one of them might be able to give me just one small clue. Mostly, they were all unhelpful and cited the Privacy Act. One thing that I did know, though, was that both the Wellnick and Hilton Asia Pacific websites were hosted by a company in Singapore. I contacted the internet hosting company several times, by phone and by email, and although sympathetic to my cause, due to the privacy laws, they were unable to help me with much information. However, after several weeks of persistence, they gave me one piece of information which was to prove crucial. They told me that emails from Wellnick were coming from a certain IP address. A search immediately told me that the IP address belonged to an internet company in Thailand. I contacted the company and after several attempts and despite severe language difficulties, I eventually found someone inside the company who offered to help. But after a few days, I received an email informing me that they could not substantiate any of my information with what was on their systems. One of the tools I was using was an email tracking software and the company themselves were very helpful and confirmed that to the best of their belief, the emails were originating from Thailand. Based on this confirmation, I persisted with the internet company in Thailand and they agreed to monitor an email that I would send to Wellnick and see if it actually went through their system. I never thought any more about it and was obviously only interested in finding out if the email was traceable. Strangely, the internet company reported that they couldn't find any sign of what I'd sent. However, a few days later, I received an email. Hi Keith, please excuse the delay in responding to your email. At this point in time, I'm currently travelling as we're closing in on a listing date for the project you're involved in. As far as any further investments are concerned, there may be a possibility of this if we can obtain the additional institutional allotment we're expecting to have. Anyhow, if you are in a liquid position, let me know if it's the previous level we discussed or the amount that you're requesting. Because if we do get this additional allotment, it will be on a first come, first served basis, as they are high in demand. With kind regards, Edward Martin. Here I was trying to trace them, and almost by accident, I enticed them back on the scene. It was obvious that they thought that I had no idea I'd been scammed and saw it as an opportunity to get more money out of me. On the other hand, I saw it as an opportunity to involve the authorities again and maybe this time trace them and even catch them. I called Ray Platts. If some months had passed uh, when Mr Jones contacted me and uh, elaborated on the fact that he had further information and he believed he had established that the group uh, behind uh, the loss of his monies was located or established in Thailand. Over the coming weeks, I had several telephone conversations with Edward Martin and his associates. Every time I spoke to his secretary, his colleagues, or Edward Martin himself, I had to pretend that everything was fine, but inside I was consumed with loathing and all I really wanted to do was scream at them. But of course, that would have achieved nothing, and if I gave anything away, I could lose them forever. In order to whet their appetites, I made up a story that I had an investment property to sell, and that within a few weeks, I'd have over half a million dollars to invest in their scheme. As Ray and I listened, I think we both felt extremely excited that at last 
there was a glimmer of hope. Mr Jones had contacted me, uh, maintaining that he had re-established contact with the persons he believed were the perpetrators behind his loss of monies. Uh, I was present at his premises uh, on one occasion when a Mr Edward Martin, or a person using that name, uh, had a telephone conversation with him and supplied to Mr uh, Jones a telephone number and outlined that he was in fact in Bangkok. With that number, I was able to channel that to uh, my contact uh, in Thailand for further investigations. Yeah, my contact in Thailand uh, responded uh, to my query on the telephone number and suggested that uh, he had identified persons in Chiang Mai. Uh, he agreed that it was the Thai authorities' responsibility and that if Keith Jones uh, was able to travel to Thailand, they'd attend uh, the matter as a complaint made in that country. By midnight the same day, I was on a flight to Bangkok, clutching my evidence and, of course, the valuable information which we'd been sent by the Thai authorities. I had copies of two emails from the Royal Thai Police, one which said that the suspects were in Chiang Mai and that there were four or five Westerners residing at a certain address, and the second which detailed the suspect's actual address, that he frequently travelled to Bangkok, the registration, make and colour of his motorbike, the name of his girlfriend, and the name and address of her father. Surely, very soon, Edward Martin and his colleagues will be apprehended. The email mentioned a Honda Wave motorbike. Clearly, there can't be many of those around. I have a meeting later with the Crime Suppression Division at the Royal Thai Police Headquarters to give my statement and present my evidence. But in the meantime, I've been summoned to the Australian Embassy for a meeting with the Australian Federal Police. I think there may be some embarrassment on their behalf at not having been instrumental in the investigation. Also, I think there may be some concerns about my security. Obviously, when Keith was away that week, I was really, really concerned for his safety. He used to ring in a couple of times a day to tell me that he was OK, but at that time I don't think we had any idea of what we were really dealing with. Coupled to that, Ray used to give me a call always in the morning and last thing at night just to make sure that I'd heard from Keith. Um, I think really the question he was asking, is Keith still alive? Given some concerns I held for the safety of uh, Mr Jones, uh, uh, and two aspects. Uh, one uh, is that uh, he'd lost a considerable amount of money and I didn't know what group or organisation may have been behind that. Uh, and two, uh, there were recent uh, killings of Australians in Thailand in respect to their own internal problems. Uh, and uh, to, in some ways, give me confidence that he had a contact over there, I made some inquiries with the Australian Federal Police and the liaison officer in that country. I went into the Australian Embassy and I was uh, greeted by three federal officers, two liaison officers and their boss in actual fact, and they uh, gave me the red carpet treatment, which was quite unusual because just about 12 months ago they'd have nothing to do with me, and in fact they told me just to ask for my money back. Very interesting. Although the Australian Federal Police were very amenable, I believe that they were a little annoyed that they were not officially involved. They also explained that as the matter was now in the hands of the Thai authorities, there was very little they could do. They also gave me their contact telephone numbers in case I should get into any difficulties, whatever that means. The Australian Embassy is an hour's ride the other side of town, and the trip back gives me plenty of time to reflect about my safety. Although I've told Edward Martin that I'm on a business trip in Perth and can't be contacted for a few days, there is definitely an uncertainty about what these people are really like, what contacts they may have, and sadly, after what has happened to me, I don't trust anyone anymore. I've just spent four and a half hours at the police station. The first two and a half hours was giving the statement, and the first half hour of that was trying to get my name and address right through the interpreter. 
The last two hours was just trying to print the statement. I tell you, if this goes well, I'm going to buy them a new printer. By now, too, there is an urgency to apprehend the conspirators, as in two days, I'm supposed to send over the rest of the money. And I fear that once they realize that there is nothing coming, I will lose contact with them again. Whatever happens, the police have got to work quickly. Later that evening, I get a call from Ray's contact. He's asked me to take a taxi over to his office. From the tone of the conversation, it doesn't sound good. I think that the chances of a new printer are fading fast. I return in total disbelief. According to Thai law, if I can't actually identify the people who've committed the crime, the police cannot prosecute, so they're taking no further action and are dropping the case. Of course I can't identify these people by sight, as I've never met them. The whole situation is ridiculous. If it wasn't so tragic, it would be laughable. And it now looks like Edward Martin and his cohorts are going to get clean away. The deadline for me to transfer the funds to Welnick has now passed. While in Bangkok, I thought of travelling to Chiang Mai to front the criminals face to face. But Anne and everyone else at home are worried about me as it is. Another thing, without local knowledge and without knowing the language, things in Thailand are very difficult. And besides, it would have been extremely foolish. While in Bangkok, I did have one final conversation with Edward Martin though, and that's when he rang me to give me the final instructions of where to send the money. But by this time, I was extremely angry and felt that I had nothing left to lose. And this is what I said. Edward, there's been a slight change of plan. Please listen carefully. I have some friends in high places and this morning they took me for a drive past your apartment in Tambon Buang. I have photographs of you on the Honda Wave. It's one of Rat's fathers, isn't it? This is the deal. All I want is the $110,472.48 that you've stolen paid into my bank account today. Then I'll leave Chiang Mai and will be out of your life forever. Remember, you are under surveillance and it will stay like that until the money is safely back in my account. Discuss it with Wararat and please tell her we know where her father lives in Tambon Nang Tong. Call me back in 10 minutes. Literally 10 minutes later, the phone rang, but it was Ray Platts checking on my safety. Needless to say, my final last ditch attempt failed. However, when I got back to Australia, I received one final email from Wellnick. Hi Keith, I've been thinking over what you said and I will agree to send you 50,000 US dollars so long as it's understood that it ends here. If you don't hold a grudge, we can make arrangements. Keep in mind it wasn't very nice of you to pretend to be interested for additional shares. Despite this, I'm willing to let bygones be bygones. I will need an immediate response from you in this matter and if you agree, I will also need a five-week period to make arrangements. Kind regards. If that wasn't bizarre enough, then there was a further twist. Uh, I was later advised by my acquaintance in uh, Thailand that uh, the information that was previously forwarded was in fact uh, correct information, but the persons associated uh, with uh, those particulars were not in fact the perpetrators of this matter. Do you believe that? So now we have the situation where the criminals are supposedly offering me some of my money back and the Royal Thai Police saying that they had the wrong suspects. There are some puzzling aspects of uh, uh, this statement given uh, uh, events that had occurred and communication that had been made by Mr Jones uh, whilst in Thailand uh, in respect to the actual information uh, and particularly the telephone call. Uh, I was led to believe that Mr Jones had made contact with persons associated with that telephone call. Uh, I believe those persons were associated with the inquiries conducted by the Thai police, uh, but uh, I can only assume that uh, further investigations uh, fail to deliver any further evidence to connect them to, to the matter. 
I've told you. <laughs> I've, I've told you. I've told you. Uh, I don't think I can say anything more than that. Uh, uh, that's going to assist you or themselves, and particularly myself. Of course, no money was ever refunded, and I hear no more from Edward Martin or his colleagues. Any return to Thailand is put on the back burner as the country is besieged by civil and political unrest. I'm curious to know what emotional effect I may have had on the scammers and how they may have felt. Probably exactly the way that you felt. Shame, embarrassment. Not so much guilt, but shame and embarrassment. Because someone had found them out, you'd played the game on them. So in this scenario, you were so determined to track these people down, you played their game. You acted the role to try and get what you wanted. They would have been horrified. And it would have had a, shaken them a little bit, destabilised them just a little, little, for just a moment. But they would have recovered pretty quickly. It just shows the resilience on your part that you were able to, to do that. So the chances are they're still doing what they did before? There's certainly that aspect, yes. Determined or not, it really didn't help me. And the likelihood is that despite my best efforts, the scammers are still at large, continuing to shatter people's lives and getting away with stealing hundreds and thousands of dollars. It's now two years since my last trip to Thailand, and at last the political situation seemed reasonably settled. That is until literally an hour after I landed in Bangkok. The yellow-clad PAD, or People's Alliance for Democracy, took over the airport. For the present, there are no flights in or out of Bangkok. So consequently, I'm having to take the 14-hour train journey from Bangkok to Chiang Mai. The question is, why am I going to Chiang Mai? To be frank, I'm not really sure. I know I want to see where these people were operating from, and I guess I want to see if there are any traces of them. This time, the Australian Federal Police and Thai authorities have no idea that I'm here. And Ray Platts has retired some time ago, so I have no official authority to back me up. Three hours from Chiang Mai. It's been a long night. It's been cold. Makes you wonder what I'm doing here, really. Oh well, things are always darkest before the dawn. I'm sure I'll feel better after a nice cup of coffee. In three days' time, I'm supposed to meet Anne in Hong Kong for a business meeting, so I only have a short time in Chiang Mai. At home, the idea of travelling to Chiang Mai seemed like quite a good one. But in the cold light of day, when you're speeding your way through a foreign country towards the complete unknown, then the idea seems to be completely stupid. My imagination is already in overdrive, and any person on a motorbike becomes an immediate suspect. Fourteen hours turns out to be nearer seventeen as we finally enter the outskirts of Chiang Mai, and I can't help but feel the level of apprehension. This is not helped when I finally step onto the platform, and we're greeted by a small army of masked government supporters, dressed in red and armed to the teeth with medieval weapons. Relieved that they're not actually waiting for me and are more likely on the watch out for anti-government PAD supporters, I find myself a friendly tuk-tuk driver to take me to my hotel. My first impressions are that Chiang Mai has a much nicer feel than Bangkok. It's definitely less manic and the climate is much more agreeable. As we drive by the Ping River, I notice some very prestigious properties and I can't help wondering if my stolen money has been used to help buy one of them. What sort of people own these? Uh, rich people. Rich people? Uh. Like you and me. <laughs> My happy driver passes me a tourist guide, which all looks very interesting, but unfortunately on this occasion, I'm here with a different purpose.
By the time I reach my hotel, it's late in the afternoon, and I decide that I may as well try and relax, as I have a feeling that the next couple of days are going to be quite emotionally challenging. It took a while, but uh, with all the language difficulties and everything, but uh, I've actually got a taxi picking me up in a few minutes and it's taking me to the address of Edward Martin, or whatever his name is, and all his cohorts. And uh, it's a condominium somewhere in Chiang Mai. Personally, I don't think they'll be there. I mean, it's been a while, but uh, you never know. And if they are, what the hell am I gonna do? I'm alone in Thailand and I'm on the trail of four people who stole a considerable amount of money from me. Two years ago, the Thai police helped to trace them to an address here in Chiang Mai, but unfortunately, due to a legal loophole, the police did nothing. I want to know where these people were operating from and whether or not they're still there. That is, if we ever get there, we seem to be completely lost. My taxi driver calls her husband for some advice. But it doesn't seem to help. No, she's, she's actually gone out. Uh, it's for directions. I'm nervous enough as it is, and all this is not making me feel any better. Good now? No, I'm not sure. Not sure? <laughs> You're not sure. Uh, now she's gone out again. This looks more promising. She's pointing the way and now she's pointing the other way. Well, surprisingly, this time we seem to be on track and my taxi driver takes me to Hill Park, but it's the wrong one. Apparently, there is Hill Park 1 and Hill Park 2, but eventually I'm delivered to the right building. The first thing that strikes me is how unkempt the building looks, but despite that, the views to the hillside are quite stunning. Somewhere up there, we're looking at where it all happened. As I look around, I can't help thinking that the thieves would have been using these shops and cafes. Maybe Edward Martin even had his hair cut here. I've already been turned away from the building by the security guard once today, but as I carry on my surveillance, I notice the security man leave his post, and I decide to see how far I can get. I walk past the empty office full of security TVs, and before I know it, I'm at the lifts. Not imagining that I would get this far, I press the button and wait for what seems an eternity. Stepping in, I immediately press the button for the 12th floor, and I can literally hear my heart thumping in my chest. Another agonizing wait and finally the doors open. And a moment later, I'm standing outside the door of my heartless enemies. Here I am. I haven't got a clue what to do next. Now what? Now what indeed? I really am in a dilemma. Minutes go by as I pace up and down agonizing whether I should knock on the door or just do the sensible thing and walk away. I devise a crude plan and make up a story that I'm looking for someone that I'd met in a bar. I scribble an address and instead of writing Tower 2, I write Tower 1 and hope that if someone is in, they will think that I'm merely at the wrong address. And then taking all my courage, I approach the door. The Thai police had originally given me the registration of the suspect's motorbike 
and in the relative safety of the car park, I check out some of the motorbikes. But unfortunately, the Thai letters mean nothing to me. Next, I find what I guess is a list of residents. As a long shot, I see if the Thai name of Edward Martin's girlfriend bears any resemblance to the name on the list. But it looks totally different to me. I guess it gets to the stage of uh, what can one man do on his own. Oh, God, that was scary enough as it was. <laughs> and it'd kill me if she knew I did that. I think I might just ask some questions of a few people around to see if anybody's heard of these people. See how we go with that. Do you speak English? A little. There's some friends of mine used to live in that. I spend the rest of the day asking the local owners if they've seen my American friend who lives in Tower 2. Do you know some Americans are around here? No. no? I'm about to call it a day when... Ah, uh, him? The man, big. Yeah, that's him, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah Morning, yeah. I, I look him walk and back. She tells me that there's an American who walks by every day at about 9 a.m. Yet another shadow and a long shot. But I decide to come back in the morning anyway. The next morning I'm back in plenty of time. And I wait. And I wait. And I wait. But of course in reality, I've no idea who I'm waiting for. Finally the store opens and I asked the owner if she's seen the American. You haven't seen him today? I, I not seen him. Oh, uh, okay. Because he... Yesterday morning, I saw him. You saw him yesterday? Uh -huh. walk, 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 walk. But not today? Today, no. Oh, uh, okay. But might he still come at this time? Yesterday, night, all night. All right, well, I'll just... I'll hang on the bridge for a few minutes to see if he turns up. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. Neither she or a dog seem to be as friendly today. I wait a little longer and wonder if he could be Edward Martin or if these have come to arrest him. I begin to feel helpless once more. Sorry to disturb you. He's obviously going to turn up today. If you see him, can you give him a card for me? Just let him know I was around. Ah, oh, you want uh, you want me here? You uh, me look see. Yeah, Nick, that's it. Yeah, okay. that'd be great. All right, thank you very much. Oh, okay. All right, thank okay. you. Bye. What was the point of that? You might say. Well, I'm not sure really. If it is the guy, or he knows of them, we're gonna scare him a bit, I guess. But if it's not, well, no harm done really. I mean, I can't keep chasing people around the world. That's what the police are supposed to do. That said, I decide to see if I can get into the building a second time. But this time, I don't get very far. Do you have a, some American stay here? The security man is helpful, but I don't think that he has a clue what I'm saying. Do you speak Thai? No. <laughs> do you speak English? <laughs> do you have any Americans here at all? And after some time, he recruits some help. It looks like they got this poor chap out of bed. Did he used to live here? The Thai police had discovered that the mobile phone that had been bought by the fraudsters was purchased using the name Joe Self. And although probably fictitious, when these people ask me who I'm looking for, the first name that comes to mind is Joe. Looks like they know someone called Joe. With a round face by the look of it. Eventually the girl goes away, and I wait either for some irate American, or even better, someone sounding like Edward Martin to come down. Ten minutes later, she returns, and I'm handed a note. Uh, okay. <laughs> I must admit, even I find it comical. Enough. I do have one more port of call, though. Remember earlier I mentioned that the initial Thai police intelligence gave the name of the suspect's girlfriend? and the whereabouts and name of her father. Previously, I've written to him and had the letter translated into Thai. In the letter, I explained what happened and then tried to appeal to him and his family honor and explained that all I wanted was my money back. I know that he received the letter as it was registered, but unfortunately, I never received a reply. The ride is over an hour out of Chiang Mai 
and my taxi driver speaks very little English. And as we drive out further and further into the country, I can't help but feel apprehensive. As we get closer, the driver gets out to ask for directions, and I feel very far from home and very alone. I wonder if I do meet this man, what he will be like. Receptive? Helpful? Violent? Eventually, after much asking, we seem to arrive at a destination. To arrive at some sort of woodshed. The driver's got out again. I'm not sure if we're here or whether he's just asking directions again, I don't know. Hello. Do you speak English? A little bit, yes. Do you, do you, do you have a daughter called Wararat? Yeah, do you... Are you there? He's gone. He's just hung up. Adam. He's gone. You come back. I decide to let my driver see the Thai transcript of my letter. He seems quite shocked. I'm convinced that the man at the other end of the phone knew exactly who I was, and I'm now concerned that my safety may be in jeopardy. I decide that chasing criminals across Thailand on my own might not be such a good idea after all. So I decide to retreat. As we drive back in silence, I finally realise that I'm not James Bond or Jack Bauer. I'm not even Michael Palin with the relative safety of the production crew. It's just me and a camera. Quite frankly, the last few days have been extremely nerve-wracking and I decide that enough is enough. Can I help you, sir? Yeah, um, can you explain what happened? Back at my hotel, I explain to the manager what I've been doing. And after speaking to my taxi driver, she tells me that the man that I was speaking to on the phone lived in a very large house. And I'm left wondering what would have happened had he been at home. So that's my story. Has what's happened destroyed my life? Certainly not. But it's definitely put a large dent into it. I've certainly learnt a lot about human nature and the injustices of the law. Hopefully, it'll also be a warning to you to always be on your guard. And finally, maybe after the authorities and corporations involved see this programme, they may be embarrassed enough to finally take some action. There is one other thing, though. Maybe. Just maybe someone out there will recognise one of these voices. And one day... These people will be brought to justice. Yeah. 